Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. This is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we convince someone they're an android for fun. Because this week we watched Journey to the Center of the Tardis. By Steve Thompson. <laughs> Directed by Matt King. And aired on April 27th, 2013. So, Journey to the Center of the Tardis. Aptly named after the Jules Verne novel, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. Which was made into that movie starring The Rock that I don't know if you ever watched, but I did, <laughs> Wait, and it what? was pretty bad. <laughs> what? <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. The Rock's been in a lot of hilarious <laughs> movies that I guess not a lot of people even know about. There's that other movie I've also watched, Race to Rich Witch Mountain, that Disney yeah, and movie. I, kn- I mean, I know about that one. That's the one he's in is a remake of the eighties one. Yeah. 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 That's that's the case with a lot of actors. You know, you look up their IMDB page or their Wikipedia page and they're like, Wow, these people who are in some pretty famous movies are also in some really not famous movies. Well, it's like Anthony Hopkins. Ah, oh, damn, I really wish was it Anthony Hopkins? Ah, oh, shoot. I wish I remembered who said this. But they uh, and I wish I remembered what movie was about, but they said like it was a really bad movie, and they're like, have I seen that movie? No, but I have seen the mansion that it paid for. <laughs> it's like, these We're people just, just do this for money. Oh. Yeah, but I mean, did the did the low-budget, like, not-famous movie really pay for the mansion? No, it was like a pretty famous movie. It was like the, the third movie in a series that was, like, pretty big, and I wish I remember now. Iron Man. It was just definitely <laughs> not Iron Man. Although I'm sure Robert Downey Jr. is just crying into his millions of millions of dollars whenever somebody insults him like oh no <laughs> iron man 3 was bad oh no <laughs> robert downey jr is the highest paid actor in the mcu by like a factor of like two i think wow it's a far cry from iron man 1 yeah well he is basically the main character a- anyway the production for this is like not that interesting no it's not and you know stephen moffat uh, has said that the the inspiration for this episode was the classic story, The Invasion of Time. Yeah, apparently both him and Steve Thompson were like really disappointed with the way that the interior of the TARDIS was was portrayed in that episode, uh, aka the inside of like the nearby BBC <laughs> warehouse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember that. I think I remember the exact like shots they're referring to. Yeah, actually. me too. <laughs> Which I guess makes them iconic in a way. <laughs> Although not necessarily because they're good, although on the other hand, the word iconic doesn't necessarily mean like memorable because it's good. No, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> Apparently, Steve Thompson's original pitch was that it, this crash landed in like a school, which is remarkably prescient for Steve Thompson based on the on like a character development thing that happens to Clara for next season. But <clears throat> huh. Moffat was like, no, let's not do that. That's a bad idea. So he's like, okay, how, how, how about a salvage crew? Moffat was like, sure, we can do that. Damn, I wanted Stephen Moffat's version of School Reunion. <laughs> Did you really, though? No, no, I didn't. Wouldn't have been any better than Toby Whithouse's version, so. School Reunion was, was, was like, pretty all right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I don't think Moffat could have or would have done it better. Yeah, that episode, weirdly come to think of it, had that Sherlock moment where they're at the pool. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Strange. But anyway, you know, this this episode, I feel like maybe maybe it's already sown these seeds, but maybe in, in like a young person or something, but maybe it's, it's, it's inspired uh, a further, you know, future generations to... To be salvage crews? <laughs> no, to be disappointed... <laughs> With journeying into the TARDIS. You know, what if like 20, 30 years from now, Doctor Who's still still around, uh, either in this incarnation or, or in a future one, and someone's like, yeah, I was really disappointed when Moffat took us into the... Moffat and, Tom, Moffat and Thompson took us into the TARDIS, so here's my version. I don't even know why Moffat was like, <clears throat> you know, we need to show the inside of the TARDIS again, because he already did it in Doctor's yeah, uh, Wife. Yeah, true. So... True. You know, I'm not really sure. And, and in that episode, we even get the old console room, which was like a big, like, oh, that's kind of cool moment. Right. And and honestly, a lot of the the journeying through the corridors and stuff is taken from that in a huge way. Yeah. And the corridors look 
basically the same, which is good from a continuity standpoint, from like, but like pretty dull from, a, <laughs> from an audience watching standpoint, I guess. Although I actually did rather like the story, so. It was all right. It wasn't anything special. I mean, I I'm not going to write home about the sets for the story because they were definitely a letdown, but I like liked the overall plot of the story quite a bit. Yeah, I just, I remember last week I was like, man, this looks awesome. And I watched the preview and, and it Previews was. Previews are always designed <laughs> to make things look awesome though, so. I don't know why yeah, I true. <laughs> made that they, they don't always succeed, but anyway, that's that's pretty much it for, for production info. Yeah. There's really nothing else interesting about this. So it begins with these three guys on a ship. And yeah, and they're like, they're do a thing. They're a salvage crew. Illegal salvage <laughs> crew. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they start picking up something on their scanners or whatever. One of them, I think we, we get this in this first scene, but one of them is supposedly uh, an android. Yeah. Well, he has a robotic voice and and eyes. Right. Yeah. His, his voice is sort of, it's it's pretty cool. It goes in and out of being robotic slash not. Yeah. That, I think that's more of a production inconsistency than anything. But well, I, No, I don't think so because they, they bring up later that the the only things that are artificial about him are his eyes, his voice box, and his arm or whatever it was, or whatever other part of him was. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Well, Wait, did he have a robotic arm, or is no, that like no, just such I a think, typical thing that I'm making that up? No, what what it, what they said was in an accident he lost his eyes, his voice box, and his memory. That's what it was. Oh right. Anyway, they they're picking up a whole bunch of junk, and we see inside the TARDIS the Doctor wants Clara to get along with the TARDIS. So presumably this takes place pretty soon after last week, I guess, or the past couple of weeks. But he's like, I want you to get along with the TARDIS. And she's like, okay. He's not wearing his coat this week, which is interesting. His, like, overcoat. Yeah, the the Doctor as a whole felt kind of off this episode. His characterization, like, what he kind of does to solve the problems in this episode, just felt a little off to me. I, I think, think Steve he, Thompson is a new writer to the show. No, he wrote... Damn it, I know I looked this up, and <laughs> now I'm forgetting what it was. <laughs> it was another episode with a rather long title. <clears throat> Damn it. Oh, Curse of the Black Spot. That's it. It's the oh, one. man. I yeah. forgot about that episode. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think personally his third story, which is, I don't remember if it was next season or season series nine, is definitely the most superior of his three. Probably because he co-wrote it with Stephen Moffat. Mm. But anyway. Mm. I don't know. The Doctor didn't feel that off to me. Until they actually started like journeying into the TARDIS, <laughs> and then it was like he was being really kind of coy about everything. And I don't know, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it because I do have things actually to say about the Doctor's characterization, which I have here on my handy dandy notes. <laughs> but the Doctor basically decides to put the TARDIS into basic mode so Clara can fly it. Uh, there's a funny little <laughs> note here that like the key he turns to put it into basic mode says Smiths on it. So I thought that was pretty neat. I don't, know, I don't know if that was intentional. John Smith. No, I think it's a Matt, Matt Smith, Smith. Okay, reference. Yeah. All right. There are callbacks to the classic show in this episode. Yes. Although I didn't catch all of them. I only caught one of them. I only caught... Well, I caught four of the callbacks, although two of them were to the modern show and two of them were to the classic show. I was just referring to the, the scene where the guy's in the console room and he's yeah. hearing that, yeah. Yeah, I caught four of those. Although there's actually apparently like six or seven. Huh. It's like a Where's Waldo uh, book. An in audio, the form of a- yeah, an, an audio <laughs> form. That's pretty cool, not going to lie. We should just hi- start hiding random, like, just in the background. I'll just slow down a lot, like Doctor Who quotes, and just play it really softly in the background, and people can try to guess what they are. Like a Where's Waldo inside the podcast. <laughs> and if you find it, we'll reward you by giving you... Your prize can be... Well, since this podcast basically runs on the budget that's like half of the BBC's pennies and, and string, uh, we won't be giving out prizes. 
anyway, the, yeah, Cloud starts flying the TARDIS, and at the exact same moment, the salvage crew activates like this magneto beam that captures magneto? the TARDIS. <laughs> It'd mean, be a lot more effective if they had Magneto on their side. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't think Magneto is down for space salvage. He has, like, bigger issues to deal with. And it captures the TARDIS, basically, and and they start drawing the TARDIS in. And it sort of... I forget how this is achieved, but it sort of, like, crashes into this pile of junk. Yeah. Just kind of gets drawn in through the front door. We see the... The salvage crew's got the, the Van Balen Brothers salvage crew. So we see the... The two brothers and the alleged android suiting up. Right. Their names are, hold on, I wrote these down. Bram, Bram. Gregor, and the android is Tricky. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm, I think I'm going to talk about these three characters at the end, but like they're so indistinct other than... Tricky. Yeah, like Bram and Gregor. Let's get Tricky. Yeah. <laughs> on DMC. <laughs> I read in the production info that originally his name was, I'm forgetting what it was, but it was something longer and Tricky was just a, a nickname. It was like mm-hmm. trick. It wasn't trickster. It was electricy. Yeah, it was electricy. It's shortened to tricky. Wow, that's no points for creativity <laughs> there. So yeah, the TARDIS is is essentially crashed. The Doctor has sort of been buried under the rubble, and, and Clara has been thrust into the interior of the TARDIS. Right. What well, tr- tricky? They're about to. They try to bust open the TARDIS door, and it doesn't work. So that's a bummer. And then they're like, well, Tricky's like, it's alive. They're like, we should just we should just throw it back. And they find, like, the guy's, the guy being the doctor, his body underneath the rubble. And they're like, okay, look, we didn't do anything. <laughs> just chuck it back, and we'll just, we'll just go, we'll just leave. Because then the doctor pops in, he's like, he isn't polite to whisper when you got guests. And he's like, these magneto beams are, like, illegal basically everywhere in the galaxy. And they're like, ah, it wasn't us. <laughs> and the doctor's like, yeah, right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> wasn't you. Normally you wouldn't be able to use this, but I took the TARDIS shields down to let pi- t- uh, Clara pilot the TARDIS. At which point I was like, why do you need to take the shields down to put the TARDIS <laughs> into basic mode? That seems like a pretty big design flaw on the part of the Time Lords. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine teaching your kid how to fly the TARDIS? You put it into basic mode, and then, like, your kid just crashes the damn thing into, like, a tree, and you just crash and burn and die because well, the shields are down? <laughs> well, okay, what's, what's like, the, the car equivalent of this? Of, like, if, if you want to drive automatic instead of manual, like, you're not going to have seat belts. Is, is that, like, what this is? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's... <laughs> no, I think it's more like... <laughs> If you want to, it's more like getting a self-driving car from Elon Musk, except there's no body to the car. (laughs) (laughs) Just a seat on top of some wheels. Like Like how you said from Elon Musk, like he's personally giving you this this death trap. (laughs) Yeah, well, if Elon, I feel like if there's going to be a self-driving car without a body, it's going to be Elon Musk's. Newest, well, quote, innovation, unquote. I mean, we saved weight on this car by cutting all those extraneous exterior panels. <laughs> SpaceX level. Saving money by using untested adherent, <laughs> whatever, untested glue for their spaceships. I mean, they're still more safe about it than NASA. They had two space shuttles blow up because yeah, of their the, lax. But NASA isn't offering commercial flights. <laughs> <laughs> I think, as far as I know. NASA did send that teacher into space, though, on that flight that got, that blew up. So. Huh. <clears throat> yeah, that was, that was why the, shoot, was it Challenger or Columbia? I think it was Columbia. <laughs> every time, every time. Well, that's why that disaster was such a, like, major moment in United States history is because NASA was sending a school teacher up mm-hmm. on the space shuttle, and she was going to teach a lesson from space about like space to elementary school kids Mm -hmm. across America. So like everybody was watching that launch and then it exploded. And that's like, that's the reason why everybody was watching was because it was a school teacher who was going up. But anyway, yeah, Elon Musk is personally (laughs) providing these doorless, bodiless, (laughs) autonomous cars. (sighs) Welcome to the future. (laughs) <laughs> St- 
still, I. Just, <laughs> you have to take the shields down to pilot and. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the doctor, this is where he starts kind of like, and I guess you can justify this as like, the salvage team would have never gone along with this if the doctor hadn't tricked them. But he's like, hey, let's let's break into the TARDIS. The salvage in there will be greater than anything you guys have ever seen in your life. He basically promises them, quote, the salvage of a lifetime, unquote. And they're like, all right. So they go in, and they're like, wow, it's bigger on the inside. This really is the salvage of a lifetime. <laughs> one of those guys is one of those scanners that tells them the price of things that reminded me of Solomon's scanner in oh, yeah. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship earlier this season, now that I think about it. God, season seven, series seven. It's been seven, a real drag. Is- well, it's 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 gone on so long. It has it's not That's even... because there's been no two parters. Oh yeah, that's true. So it's yeah, been Yeah, that's why. Wow. So unlike the previous seasons, which for us we cover quicker because we do two parters in one episode. Yeah. We've had to actually go through like all fourteen episodes of the season. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't realize that until now. And on the flip side, Series 9 is, like, predominantly two-parter, so that one we're going to go through, like, really quick. But, yeah, Seasons... Well, also, Season 7, like, in real time was long because they split it halfway down the middle. Right. But then the Doctor, like, activates the TARDIS self-destruct, and he's like, yeah, I'll kill you in an hour if you don't get Clara out. And they're like, wow. And I'm just like, well, this is is pretty in line with the uh, uh, the 11th Doctor's character. Sure, yeah, I guess... I guess it just felt a little off when it happened, especially when they're like they tried and they try and leave. they're like, well, we'll just leave, and he'll, so the door is locked, and he's like, if you try, he the doctor um, reduces the time to like thirty minutes. Yeah, it's like if you try that again, I'll make it fifteen. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I don't kinda, even know why they're complaining because that guy has a scanner that literally scans for Clara. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. The doctor's like, well, it's gonna take us forever to find Clara in this infinite TARDIS, and the guy's just like sitting there like. Uh, hmm. <laughs> just like hiding his money scanner. <laughs> I kind of knew that the doctor was bluffing. Or, I mean, I didn't know, but when that info was revealed, I wasn't surprised. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Because he's done it before. He did it in Victory of the Daleks. This before. <laughs> well, he did it in Victory of the Daleks. He pulled out that jammy Dodger and he's like, I'm going to push his button to right. blow up the TARDIS. Mm-hmm. And they're like, okay, do it. And he's like, just kidding. It's It's. It's just a biscuit. <laughs> yeah, neither the seventh doctor nor the eleventh doctor has ever hesitated to lie to their own benefit. Yeah, and this is just another one of those instances where, again, the eleventh doctor is not as nice as everybody thinks he is. <laughs> so they 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 start journeying into the center of the TARDIS. Yeah. Oh, there's a line here where the doctor says, "My shit, my rules," and I just had a flashback moment to Star Trek. That's all I wanted to say. First season of Star Trek Discovery, the captain's like, my ship, my rules. Basically just running it like a dictatorship. Dictatorship? <laughs> wow. Wow. <clears throat> if it was a potato farming ship, it would be a dictator ship. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> So Clara is lost. Yeah, Clara is... And she doesn't know where she is. She makes a poor decision to open a door where there's a blinking red light on the outside. She's like, yeah, it's probably uh, probably a bad idea to open this door. And she opens the door and it's just an explosion on the other <laughs> does, side of the does door. Does she say that's probably a bad idea to open yeah. this door? She says, well, blinking red button either means uh, something really bad is happening or don't open this door. <laughs> He's like, well, let's just do it. And she opens the door and he's like, well, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm, I'm, she, she goes through a lot of different areas. I'm struggling to remember what they all are. She goes past the TARDIS pool, which I think we also saw in Invasion of Time. I think? I don't remember. But yeah, we see the TARDIS pool. That's the only one I remember. Oh, she goes to the library as well. Oh, right. And she sees that book, The History of the Time War. She opens right, it right, right, right. and says something like, oh, so that's who. And then we don't really know what she's referring to. She kind of, she brings this up later, but again, she gets cut off by the Doctor. And she ends up forgetting it anyway, because the Doctor resets the timeline. Yeah. Spoilers. Can't wait for Stephen Moffat does the Time War. We're almost there. Day of the Doctor. It's actually like a month away, and we'll be there. Yeah, the, 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 50th, uh, the 50th anniversary, like, thing. Special. Event. Multiple 
episode thing, I believe. I believe. Yeah, well, like I guess specials, the I seeds are sown in the name of the Doctor, which is the end of the season, and then there's the day of the Doctor. And then sure. there's the resolution to the 11th Doctor's story in whatever the heck. <laughs> I don't, don't ask me. The time of the Doctor, I think. That's confusing. Yeah. Plus there's that mini prequel to Day of the Doctor named Night of the Doctor. Mustn't forget about that. <laughs> so, as far as I can remember, they kind of just run around for a while. Well, so uh, they split up. The, yeah, one because, of the... Because uh, Gregor convinces them to split up, and he tells Bram to go back to the console room and start just stripping it for parts. Right. He's like, all right, sure. So... I guess this is so that they don't, like, get lost and end up dying. I guess, but also so they can get a head start on... Uh, on stripping the parts. Yeah, on stripping the TARDIS, <laughs> I guess. So he goes back. And and Gregor eventually finds the living metal room, which is a room that looks kind of like a almost like a electronic tree with these big kind of bulbous right, things right, hanging. Right. Yeah, I forgot about down. this. I'm surprised. I I'm surprised of how much I'm surprised at how much I forgot about what they do. It's not all that undistinct. Yeah, non-distinct. Wasn't this Bram? Actually, I'm looking at my death count. I have Bram first. No, Bram. Bram. Yeah. Well, because Bram goes to the console room. And then he opens up the console, and then he finds a ladder, which he climbs down, and then he gets killed there. Oh, oh yeah, 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 all right. <clears throat> but this is when that scene happens as a callback, because he takes off the console panel, and I guess, like, time starts leaking, because we hear a whole bunch of quotes, audio clips, from prior episodes. And the ones I picked up on were Susan saying, time in relative dimensions in space. Uh, I caught nine saying the whole hordes of Genghis Khan could try get through that, uh, couldn't <laughs> get through that door, and believe me, they tried. Uh, Amy saying something like, we're in space. Uh, and then Ian at the very end saying something like it's a space it's like a it's a spaceship in a junkyard disguised as a police box or whatever he says so those are the ones I caught there were some third doctor lines in there or at least one yeah the third doctor says a line about it being dimensionally transcendent or whatever the fourth doctor apparently also has a line in there and the fifth doctor at the very end has the final line saying uh, you've changed the desktop theme apparently from the one where he meets the tenth doctor <clears throat> the one we took our name from. Oh. <laughs> so, I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool, uh, having these little just kind of audio callbacks. Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, like I said, he climbs down the ladder, and this is when actually the Doctor and Tricky have met back up with Gregor in the living metal room, and he's taking some of the living metal, and he tells Tricky to blow the door open, because there's no door anymore. But the TARDIS then creates a door because it doesn't want to get blown up. But then it just starts looping them back around them themselves in the corridors. Yeah. I, just I, keep going I in think, circles. I mean, the whole like impetus behind this is that the TARDIS didn't want them to take any of the living metal. Yeah. Apparently, the, the TARDIS uses the living metal for like reconfiguring rooms and building things. And I guess this is how it builds the console rooms. In case you were ever yeah. curious. <laughs> it's uh, this tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is like... Now that I think about it, there is all this like unnatural, natural stuff, right? There's this metal tree. Well, mm-hmm. metal's natural, but I mean, in a way, like there's this living metal tree, and then like there's the there's that line later that the doctor says like time lords capture suns. Like suns are a natural source of yeah. of energy. Yet this is like a captured sun. Right. I think the doctor's explained what the eye of harmony is before, like that. There's like a star right before it goes supernova, captured in that moment in time. She makes you wonder, like, for, did they capture a star for every TARDIS they built? Yeah, must be. <laughs> and if they did, like, isn't like isn't that kind of a violation of their own principles to protect the timeline? Like, <laughs> What if they ever followed their own principles? Okay, though, I, mean, like, I guess that was, like, the whole point about the Time Lords, that they were big hypocrites, and that's why the Doctor was like, screw them. Yeah. But, I'm just going to be a solo hypocrite. The Doctor, like, does a big throwback to the Time Lords, like, really dumb hats and outfits in this episode at one <laughs> point. He? When they get to the room with the Eye of Harmony in it, he's like, Time Lords, brilliant engineers, really bad sense of, he's like, really bad hats, bad mm. sense of, like, style, but brilliant engineers. <laughs> or whatever he says. <clears throat> so, yeah, so they call Bram 
on the radio and they hear him going down the ladder and then his line goes dead because he gets attacked by one of the weird zombie creatures in the TARDIS. Yeah, this is kind of done like the, um, the not the Slender Man, the, the Crooked, Crooked Man. Man. The Slender yeah, Man. Yeah, did you think it was done in kind of the same way? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I thought these guys were pretty scary. Again, until you actually see them like full on. It's like the, the hiddenness of them is, is what's kind of creepy. Right. As, I mean, they get also, pretty creepy again when the doctor explains what they are. Yeah, I kind of thought that that's what they were, though, already. Based on this scene where, because now Clara finds her way back to the console room, and the doctor and Gregor and Tricky are there as well. Yeah. But they're kind of, they're on separate, like, time tracks. And you get these, this sort of intersplice, these intersplice like, cuts that kind of indicates that, that, each party mm-hmm. is like well, the doctor's their own aware. version of the creature or yeah. whatever. <clears throat> well, because Talara kind of like is staring down the creature in her room and she gets cornered, but then the doctor uses the people scanner that Gregor has to pull Clara into their version of the console room. Right. Then she punches him. He's like, ow. She's like, why do you have zombies in the TARDIS? And he's like, hmm, can't tell you. Hmm. <laughs> He's like, what? He's like, yep, can't tell you. No, not going to tell you. The doctor obviously knows what these things are already. And the doctor's like, yep, so I was just kidding about the uh, self-destruct. Just going to turn it off. And then he sees this readout that's like, engine going to blow up. And he's like, never mind. <laughs> Engine's going to blow up anyway. <laughs> Throughout so- all this, we've been hearing the cloister bell, which I just want to bring up as that key piece of TARDIS lore that they haven't dropped, thankfully, that they introduced in the classic series. That bell that sounds when the TARDIS is in, like, dire straits. Right. So I forget what the what the plan is now, but they have to get to, like, the... They're going to the, the engine harmony. room. Yeah, the I, they're going to the Eye of Harmony, to the engine room, to fix it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's all it was. Like, we have to fix it. Let's go there. <laughs> It's a spaceship, and if it's a spaceship, it can be fixed. Although the Doctor calls the TARDIS alive a lot in this episode. Or at least sentient. Oh, apparently there's also in the spillage, the time spillage, there's a line, there's the line from Doctor's wife. Wow. It's self where the Doctor, where it just is like, you always call me sexy. Is that my name? And he's like, you bet it, it's your name or whatever. Mm. So they're, they're being chased down by the creatures, but they get to the Eye of Harmony eventually. Yeah. Oh, well, they have this confrontation with, with Tricky, where Gregor because, because reveals the, it. The fuel rods start exploding and shooting metal pylons through the oh, walls. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. And, and Tricky the, gets, like, impaled. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, like, just, he, he tells Gregor to just cut off his, because he gets hit in the shoulder. He's, like, just amputate my arm. I'm, yeah. I'm an android. It won't matter. It can be replaced. He says he won't even feel it. Uh, which is, there's a little cognitive dissonance here where he's like, I won't even feel it, yet he's like... In pain? In, yeah. I don't know, maybe that accident he was in ages ago fried all his nerves so he doesn't feel pain anymore. I don't know. No, I mean, I think it's on, on his part, right, where he's like, androids don't feel pain! Oh, oh, oh I'm an android! Oh! <laughs> He's just like, it's just like, really? You still think you're an android? Well, it's like earlier too when he's like scared, and he's like, androids don't get scared! I'm not scared! <laughs> And Gregor reveals that Tricky actually isn't an android. Yeah, apparently the doctor had figured this out like ages ago, and he's like, yep, go on, tell him, tell him, it's not an android. And then after he tells him, like, okay, I just cut the metal beam. I'm like, well, why did... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this entire thing kind of falls flat, and maybe that's part of it. I think that is why it falls flat. <laughs> but it's like, also, who cares about these three guys, honestly? Like, they have so little characterization so little reason to I cared about Tricky I didn't care about the other two yeah, I cared about Tricky I mean, though I don't know Tricky's like the youngest of the three it's like the most idealistic the The thing is like they're this ruth. No, they're not ruthless but like they're this they're pretty ruthless yeah I guess they're pretty ruthless but they're this salvage team and like I could get behind them if they like had hearts of gold like behind it all but I don't think they really did they have no redeeming features basically <laughs> They have no yeah. redeeming features. Yeah, they don't. And they Except also Tricky. they also revealed that the reason why they convinced Tricky that he was uh, an android was because he was the uh, the favorite of their father who owned the company, or just a group, I guess. I don't know if it's a company. 
And they're like, we can't have Tricky taking over. We have to convince him he's just an android so we can be the leaders. Yeah, because the dad made him captain, Tricky. Right. And the other two brothers didn't like that. Yep. Like I said, they're pretty ruthless. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> but then the doctor tries to, like, have him reconcile. Cause he's like, look, he didn't want to, like, cut your arm off. You know, he hesitated. Because, like, you know, he still cared about you, kind of. He didn't want to leave you to die. Tricky's like, yeah, BS. Yeah, that 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 is, the doctor does say, like, you know, this shows that deep down he, he still has a heart or whatever. And, like, I don't know, I felt that line could have landed better if, like, they actually did somehow have hearts of gold beneath it all. Well, Bran, well, this is the, th- well, sorry, Bran is the one who just, <laughs> just no one cares about Bran. <laughs> Gregor kind of does redeem himself, though, when they, they're in the Eye of Harmony and they're cornered by the, this is when the Doctor reveals. Actually, before we get there, sorry, we should talk about this other rather important scene because the Doctor and Tlara gets separated from uh, Gregor and Tricky. This is actually before the thing with the arm happens and the Doctor and Tlara get pushed out into this room that just has a cliff and this is when the doctor confronts Tlara and he's like okay we're gonna die you can just tell me who you are now and she's like I'm I'm just a just a person isn't that after the Eye of Harmony I thought it was no I think because I think it's it's happening like concurrently because they go there (laughs) while Gregor and Tricky are still at the Eye of Harmony in the Eye of Harmony whatever or Gregor and Tricky get captured yeah I guess you're right it happens after the Eye of Harmony because they get cornered in the Eye of Harmony by the creatures. Yeah, I guess it does happen afterwards. My bad. Because Gregor, yeah, because they all get captured. And then this is when Gregor has his redemption moment. Because he... Kind of. Shoves all the creatures into the Eye of Harmony and the Doctor. This is when the Doctor reveals that they're like copies of them from the timeline where they all get vaporized by the Eye of Harmony. Right. Because like all of time in the TARDIS is happening at once. Classic Stephen Moffat thing. <laughs> There's like echoes of themselves. Because we also see like... an echo of Clara saying something from the beginning of the episode. Yeah, it's some doctor's wife stuff. And... Done again. <clears throat> the doctor reveals that they're like them, and yeah, Gregor shoves them into the Eye of Harmony, and then him and Tricky get turned. But not before the doctor and Clara can escape. And this is when they get to the cliff room where the doctor goes, alright, you can just tell me who you are now. She's like, I, I I have no idea what you're talking about. And he's like, there was a version of you in the Dalek Asylum and you died and you saved my life. And there was the Victorian version of you and you were a governess and we fought the great intelligence. He's like, I, I have no idea yeah, what the, any of these the do- words are. The doctor is getting real mad here. And she's like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, you were there. You were there. And she's like, I, you're scaring me, doctor. <laughs> They're like actually scaring me. And then the doctor comes to this conclusion. Yeah. Uh, which is that in order, well, one, that Clara doesn't really know, really doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And he's like, wait a minute. The way to solve all our problems is we have to jump, jump off the cliff. <laughs> Clara's she's like, like what? You've, you've gone off the deep end, doctor. I don't know. But on the other hand, you stay here, you're going to die because the Eye of Harmony is going to blow up. So, I mean, what's there to lose? I, mean, can... I would rather die like falling into a mysterious void and get <laughs> ripped to shreds by an explosion that happens at every moment in time all at once. I mean, I don't know. You can try and you can try to free solo this, you know, climb down the cliff. <laughs> no, no, no time. <laughs> yeah, true. But it works. It dumps them in the console room. Again, more Doctor's Wife stuff where they like delete the other console room and it just dumps them in the main console room. Yeah. So, all right. Other Doctor is... Wife stuff. The Doctor mentions the console room is the safest room in the TARDIS, which is why the TARDIS like always tried to get them there and put them in the echoes and everything. Sure. Yeah, you got to wonder if these creatures uh, are just are like naturally in the TARDIS or like is it because of the... The, this mishap or like I think it's because of this mishap like I think the doctor tries to make it out or and pretty successfully makes it out to be that it's just because of this mishap that this is yeah. happening that be, the time is leaking because the eye of harmony is breaking down yeah okay sure anyway some time shenanigans uh, happen now I didn't really get this but apparently yeah it's obtuse to say the least yeah and I feel like I feel like even the dialogue in this scene was was made obscure purposely because they were like, we don't know how to resolve this, so we're just going to wing it and, and have the dialogue be uh, vague. 
as to what they're actually doing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. There's a, well, cra- so there's a crack in time. At the beginning of the episode, Clara picked up uh, like something. Like a crystal or something like a little. Like it looks sort of like a mini nuke, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and it burned her. And the doctor sees like an imprint on her hand from the thing, like a burned, like branding. And it says like big friendly button or something, a big red button or something like that. And the doctor's like, huh, wow, I tried to send my message, a message to myself and I failed. But this time, if I get it right, because that thing flew into the TARDIS when they got caught by the magneto beam earlier. And the way it's played off earlier is that it, it like you're supposed to interpret it as have coming from the salvage ship because you see you see Bram or Gregor like arm it right before it flies into the TARDIS. <clears throat> Except at some point you would realize the TARDIS doors were closed, so they couldn't have done that. And then you're like, well, what, well, where did it come from? Where it came from was the Doctor took it from Bram, carves the the words into it, and then chucks it through a crack in time and then that's how it lands inside the console room at the start of the episode yeah this is some interstellar shit where they like go back in time and give themselves a message or whatever anyway but this time the doctor goes in the whole the the doctor himself goes into the crack instead of just throwing it through and like gives it to himself basically clara still picks it up but now the doctor picks it up and he's like oh big friendly button and he pushes the button on the little mini nuke because it's Actually, what it actually is, is the controls to the magneto beam. So by pushing it, he turns it off, which that thus erases the rest of the timeline from existence because the TARDIS doesn't actually get captured because the beam gets turned off and then the Doctor puts the shields up and they leave. Whoa. <laughs> Except the Doctor seems to still remember everything that happened because he makes an oblique reference to it at the end. He's like... Clara's like, man, I'm so tired because she comes in from like the TARDIS pool, I guess. Yeah, and she's forgotten what she read in the book, which she also... We she's skipped forgotten over, the whole day. Yeah, so we skipped over this, but while they're on the cliff, Clara is about to confront the doctor about what she read in the book, but he cuts her off. Yeah. But she forgets everything. And I'm not surprised, though, that the doctor can remember like across timelines. Yeah, he says like... Because that Because what he says is... Well, we've lived two days in the span of one. And I was like, why would you say that? And it's like, oh, no, no reason. <laughs> <laughs> but this also, because at this point, all three of the salvage crew team yeah. uh, have died. Uh, but they come back because of this reset. Yeah. And it looks, it, it appears as if they've, they're going down a better path now. They've kind of reconciled. Because you see this picture, mm-hmm. they, it zooms in and, and they're all smiling and they're with their dad. Yeah, because at the beginning of the episode, that picture uh, is, has been torn so that Tricky's not in it because, you know, they tr- convinced Tricky and Andrew right, he was an right. android and they didn't want him to know he was one of the three brothers. And they had torn the picture and now it miss, uh, he's in the picture with their dad right. and the two, brother, the two other brothers. And that's how it ends. Clara's like, okay, she goes back to the pool, I guess, <laughs> or, or whatever. <clears throat> yep. The first thing I want to talk about is the TARDIS rearranging the rooms because I realized uh, there was that episode where the doctor gave like Rory really complicated directions to get to the bedroom and was like, why, why doesn't the, the TARDIS just like change the corridor so that you go th- out of the console room immediately into their bedroom? <laughs> like he can do that, right? <laughs> kind of makes the uh, the whole like complicated directions thing about the inside of the TARDIS a bit null and void, I guess. Bit of a dick move on... On, the on Idris's part. On both the, t- the TARDIS and the Doctor's <laughs> part. So. Yeah, the TARDIS, I guess. I guess Idris was just that one version and not the, you know, well, it was the, 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 like, of the soul of the TARDIS. Sure. Anyway, part of the reason why I think this episode is uh, not great or fondly remembered is because, one, because the, the, the monsters in this episode are pretty similar to the ghost from last week yeah Uh, and two because a lot of this episode is pretty similar to the doctor's wife yeah and that's the thing i was surprised when i um read that stephen moffat was disappointed with invasion of time and wanted to revisit that concept because i don't know i feel that this was also a disappointing look into the interior of the tardis well because there's not really a lot you can do with the interior of the tardis right and uh, moffat basically did everything you could in this episode right you see the the swimming pool the library you see the eye of harmony itself the engine room basically and then the the living metal room like what else can you actually show because 
every other room in the TARDIS is just going to be like a regular room in like a house. Like if you remember when we saw, what was it, Tegan well, was- or Nissa's or Perry's bedroom. Sure. And the, it w- it just looked like a bedroom, right? There was nothing that was like, oh, this is the TARDIS, except the fact that the door had roundels in it. The Zero Room was just like an empty white room. <laughs> oh, man, I forgot about the Zero Room. <laughs> what about that Zero Cabinet that the Fifth Doctor yeah. freaking bastard made oh, Tegan man. and Nissa like carry up the mountain? <laughs> I was I was watching this documentary. I was watching this documentary, American documentary from the early 80s about Doctor Who. Matthew Waterhouse was in it. And, and he said that in that story, in Legopolis, or wait, was that Castrovalva or Legopolis? Castro, it was Castrovalva. Yeah, it was Castrovalva. Because Legopolis was the previous story yeah. where the fourth Doctor eats it by, falling off, a t- by yeah. falling off a radio dish. But hey, the moment had been prepared for. But anyway, Matthew Waterhouse was like, yeah, I was super hungover during all of that. And at one point, I, as soon as the camera cut, I ran behind a tree and threw up. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when he was uh, when he was captured by the the master in that like BDSM like configuration. <laughs> yeah, they used had, math like, to like generate this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah apparently he had a massive hangover for like most of that. Wow. <laughs> they like edited Logopolis together into like a feature length, just one long thing. They're showing it in theaters along with like a modern day interview with uh, who played who played Nissa and Tegan. Sarah Sutton and J- Janet Fielding. Janet Fielding. And I have like an interview with them about the making of the episode, and I saw a little clip of it. And she was <laughs> Janet Fielding was like, "I got in a lot of trouble one day because they were filming the scene where where Tom is regenerating. And he was lying on the ground, and I I went in and I started messing with the leaves around his head, <laughs> and they like they caught it on a camera. And I was messing with these leaves, and I got in a lot of trouble for that." <laughs> How did we get start talking about this? Because uh, of the Zero Room. Oh, right. Which got into the Zero Cabinet that, again, the bastard Fifth Doctor made <laughs> Tegan and Nyssa carry up that mountain. <laughs> but hey, it was all the Master's fault because it was all just like a computer simulation or whatever the plot twist was. Yeah. Then the Master gets trapped in the computer simulation that's shrinking and collapsing and should have killed him. But then he shows up like two weeks later. He's like, <laughs> you thought you killed me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just feel a lot of this episode was disappointing in a way. Like, again, I I know we touched on this before, but, like, the salvage crew being, like, personality-less almost. Yeah. Other than their, like, anger at each other when when Tricky finds out he's an android. Or he's not an android, rather. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. They They just didn't really have anything defining about them, I think, was the thing. There was nothing that was like, oh, the... These are the salvage crew, right? Yeah, I mean, you think back to last week with um, Dr. What's-His-Name, or Professor What's-His-Name and, and uh, the assistant... Emma. Emma. I don't know why. Uh, uh, companion, oh, Alec. rather. Alec and Emma. Like, they didn't have much backstory, but they had, like, at least some. It wasn't too in Well, because Alec was, you know, part of the war and... Yeah, they at least had, like, that. Well, because they threw out the salvage thing pretty early on. Basically, as soon as they actually start journey into the TARDIS it pretty much goes away until the guy picks up the thing from the living tree and Tricky tries to get him to drop it and then once he does they don't really bring it up again it's not it's like there's nothing about this episode that required them to be a salvage crew I guess could have just been like vacationers and the (laughs) TARDIS accidentally got stuck in a tractor beam right and and what the plot would have been basically the same So, yes. Except for the guy yeah. having his freaking Clara scanner that he doesn't use till halfway <laughs> through the episode. He, he's the real jerk. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't. Enjoy, I didn't enjoy this episode. though. go. I guess though. I guess because of Matt Smith and Jenna Coleman, I suppose because of the Doctor and Clara, and not because of the salvage crew. Sure. I guess. I, I mean, I liked that scene where the doctor's confronting Clara, and she's like, I, "I literally don't know what's going on. Like, I'm genuinely scared of you right now. Like, I bought that that Clara was scared of the doctor in that moment." Yeah, that's. I mean, that's the scene where I was like, "All right, now I'm now I like kind of care about what's going on again." <laughs> and it's kind of setting up the scene where the doctor's like almost using this or driving himself mad with this mystery 
that uh, the story seems to indicate really isn't a mystery because Tali's like, I have literally no idea what you're talking about. Is, are they going to come at you with like, this was actually just a huge coincidence and the doctor was just driving himself crazy? <laughs> no spoiler. You, you got to wait. Like, it's three weeks. We'll be there. We have Crimson Horror, Nightmare, and Silver, and then three we're there. Three weeks is like three years. When it's you're also waiting. like three minutes. Did you say when you're reading? <laughs> when you're waiting. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's also when you're reading. Reading is freaking boring. Is it? Got, yeah. I don't know. If there's a no, book, it's nice. I was going to say, if you, like, if you even like marginally like the book, it's not really that boring. The only time I've been bored reading, and the only time that I actually gave up on a book was freaking Scarlet Letter. Screw you, Nathaniel Hawthorne. <laughs> that book is so dull and so boring. The new American Gothic. <sighs> I'm just kidding. I have no idea what that e- book is even about. It just you feel. I just feel like the new American Gothic somehow characterizes that book. That I have no idea what the plot is or characters are or anything. So it's really, about, this is all just a stab in the dark. And it's about Puritans. <laughs> it's about a Puritan who cheats on her husband and because of that she has to wear the quote scarlet letter quote on her on her personage which is basically an A uh, a scarlet A which gets stitched into her clothing which she has to wear all the time now so everybody knows she's an adulterer it's A for adultery and then, and then that's like the, the book's about her, her trying to live in a Puritan right. village while being an adulterer it is the most dull book <laughs> I have ever read I wanted... Go read it now. I, I wanted to give up. I'll lend it to you if you want. <laughs> sure. Well, you know the story behind Nathaniel Hawthorne, right, is that his ancestors were involved in the Salem witch trials, and he felt guilt over that, and he felt he needed to make up for that. That book would have been way cooler if there were witch trials in it. <laughs> well, yes, I forget what it's called. A pretty famous short story um, about... I'll link it. I don't even remember what it's called, but it's kind of about witchcraft in in the northeast i will give the scarlet letter credit for the final like two chapters which were like those two chapters were all right but i had to sit through the previous like 20 <laughs> to get there kind of like this story i guess you sit through the salvage crew stuff and then you get do- the doctor and clara on the cliff i guess yeah you know what yeah yeah I so like yeah, i mean i guess you can say that this story only gets interesting when it's driven up against a Sorry, that doesn't really work. No. <laughs> I thought you were going to go for I guess the story really only gets interesting when it actually focuses on the main characters of the show. Or when it jumps but... off the cliff. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm out of things to say. Same here. You can email us at the doctor at decorativevegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry pants, love letters, your thoughts on the interior of the TARDIS. You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Trust Your Doctor. Be sure to leave a rating if you liked the show. Check us on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching The Crimson Horror, but until then, the end. 